All right, hi everybody. I hope everyone is doing well. As always, uh, let me know if um, for some reason things aren't working in the chat, uh, you know, just give me a heads up. But otherwise, um, welcome to lecture seven for industrialized construction. And um, our agenda for today is that uh, I will give a lecture on the building as a product, uh, including um, looking at platforms, processes, and projects as a part of that. And then uh, after the break, we are going to have a guest lecture. Um, and so uh, looking forward to, uh, to, have, to welcoming um, Joanna Demko Bartlome from Swiss PropTech, and she'll be joining us after lecture. And I even see she's online now. So, um, so hi, Joanna. For, thanks for, for joining us. Um, as always, please keep, uh, keep yourselves on mute. Um, please put any questions in the chat. And we're going to try a couple of uh, new things um, today, including using some breakout rooms and Google Jamboard. But I'll get to that in just a moment. So uh, unless there are any urgent concerns, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the, uh, our lecture number seven. So uh, last class, we talked about the framework for industrialized construction. Um, and hopefully also in your reading assignments, you began to think about these, um, these nine areas of industrialized construction that you can see um, on the wheel. So we have the eight areas and then the one idea that we need continuous improvements um, all the way around in order to uh, you know, think about industrialized construction. And we talked about how none of these individual areas are that new or novel, but really what industrialized construction does is repackages these areas into a kind of holistic mindset for industrialized construction that is rather unique and different than we see in a lot of other areas of uh, traditional kind of architecture, engineering, and construction. So uh, with that, um, today's lecture where we're going to talk a lot about, um, uh, we're going to talk about product platforms, uh, processes, and how projects connect to that. It really focuses in on these two specific areas of um, industrialized construction. It touches on all of them, of course, but it really emphasizes the planning and control of processes and the development of technical systems. So as you start to think about your group projects, um, and I'll say a little bit about that during, right before the break, um, the group projects, but uh, these two areas are the, um, are the key focuses of today. But before we kind of jump into uh, the details here about, um, about the lecture, I actually wanted to make sure we had a chance also to interact a little bit. Um, so we're going to try using the breakout rooms. And I want you to start uh, with the discussion of what does the building as a product mean to you? So a couple times in class, I've talked about uh, this idea that we're going to think about the building as a product. Um, and so I would, before I get into what I think that means, I would really um, love it for each of you to, to discuss in breakout rooms um, of three to four people. And here's how it's going to work. So I'm going to try to initiate the breakout room feature in Zoom. And I believe it will assign you into a breakout room of three to four people. Um, then you can add your ideas as sticky notes into the class Google Jamboard. So if, um, if you uh, go to the link bit.ly uh, IC Jam that we have linked here, you can kind of open up the Jamboard. And I see some of you are probably already joining that link now. Um, and uh, so you can put your answers in the sticky notes um, on the Jamboard. I'll show you an example on the next page. Uh, and then after five minutes, I'm going to close the breakout rooms. And uh, that means it'll kind of start a countdown where you have a final two minutes to kind of wrap up the discussion. And then you can return to the main re meeting room anytime during those two minutes. I think that's how it works. We're going to try it out and see how it works. And just so you know, this is what the Jamboard looks like. So you can go to, to Bitly IC Jam, go to the, the Jamboard, um, and start putting in some answers as your group is talking about it into the, into the Jamboard. All right, so I'm gonna start the breakout sessions. Let's see if I get this right. All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, so I see lots of great answers. In general, um, th again, this was, I'm still learning how to do this, uh, but please feel free to, to throw into the chat if you felt like that was enough time or uh, if that was too short, I'll keep that into consideration for next time. 
Um, but I wanted to bring us back together. I started to see some really great answers here. So, um, you know, we've got uh, talk, people talking about systems thinking, design with the uh, end user in mind, um, the outside in market based approach, um, looking at the process, uh, uh, repeating itself, the design repeating itself, no longer a unique project. I can't touch on all of these, but, uh, but overall, I think these are some really great. Uh, answer. So uh, it seems to me you're already beginning to understand some of the points of the course of industrialized construction. And that's great to hear. Um, so I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint slides and I will continue along with the lecture so that you can um, uh, so you can kind of hear my perspective on it. And I think it's pretty close to what some of you were saying so far. So um, Let's start with the overall point of, of this lecture is to talk about projects, processes, and platforms. And this will be um, kind of the high view on, on, what we're, on what we're talking about is three different things. So project, process, and platforms. And let me go into more specifics for each one of these. So the first is the question of what is a project? And this is something that we're, that we're quite useful uh, or quite used to thinking about in construction and architecture. Um, but we don't always have a great definition for it. So a project is defined as a series of activities defined with a starting point and an end point with a certain amount of resources allocated. Okay, so there's a, you have a starting point and an end point and you have resources and they all go towards that project. The project exists only once and has its own unique prerequisites, right? So a project is something that happens one time. We've talked about this um, um, in, this, in the course so far. And so here's an example of a project in construction and how it might work. So you have the design and planning to begin with, and then you go to manufacturing. Um, maybe at the same time you would have the, the earthwork or the groundworks, and then you might assemble on site, and then you have some site work that needs to be done. And this is, whether it's industrialized or not industrialized, this is kind of the, the approach in which construction projects exist. Okay, so this is what a project is. Let's talk about what is a process. So a process is a continuous flow of activities that uses information and resources to fulfill its role, which is to create value for the customers. But a process does not have a clear start and end point in time. And so we've kind of modeled it below with this idea of information and resources. And processes continue forever. They're repeatable. They're something that you can build upon and improve because you, you you kind of think about them in continuity without ever ending. So this is the idea of a process. And finally, we're gonna talk about what is a platform. And this definition I think is, is a very good definition. You'll also find it in the reading that you'll be assigned um, for the next week. Uh, a platform is a set of common components, modules or parts that form a common structure from which a stream of derivative products can be efficiently developed and produced. Um, and I think the example of the Legos is one that we use quite often, um, but platforms allow multiple products to be built within the same technical framework, right? So uh, platforms kind of predefine the rules in which um, different components or parts or modules can interact with each other, but they can be combined in very different ways to result in different outputs of different products, but using the same technical framework. So um, I wanted to give an example. Lego is one that, I, that we see a lot, and I'll come back to that, but I wanted to give an example um, of, of another type of platform to, to, from automotive industry, which we've talked about. So this is from Volkswagen. It's called the MQB platform, or uh, in, in English, they translate it as the Modular Transverse Toolkit. Uh, and essentially, it is the chassis or the platform for their car development um, that Volkswagen built. And you can see here in the image, you have some dimensions and some changes that are uniform. So the, the, the distance from the front axis um, to, the, to, the, to the start of the, the drivetrain is a uniform um, dimension. But there are other dimensions that can be variable and can change within the platform, right? And what's interesting is that this platform cost $60 billion for Volkswagen to develop, right? So that means that this was $60 billion not spent on delivering cars, but on developing the processes around the platform and to, you know, all the processes to make sure that, that this platform will work for a variety of products. And then 
Um, what you may not know is that there are an entire, uh, several lines of cars that are all built upon this MQB platform. Um, so this includes, um, you know, uh, Skoda Octavia, the Volkswagen Golf, and the Audi A3. In fact, here are a list of all the different car models that are built upon the MQB platform. And the idea that Volkswagen had, they began this development, I think it was in 2013, 2014, is similar to other automotive manufacturers, is that if you can standardize certain parts, create a certain platform, then you can configure or customize different models depending on you know, different user preferences, but you still have the underlying pieces to be the same. So when I talk about platforms, that's a really good example from automotive industry. I don't think that's the, you know, the necessarily only way we can apply it to construction. As I've mentioned before, automotive and construction have parallels, but shouldn't be just copied one to another. Uh, but it's a good example of how a platform can provide standardization and flexibility um, to meet customer needs while increasing manufacturing capabilities. Um, let's talk a little bit about platforms and industrialized construction. So here we have the process of industrialized construction in a very general sense. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to have some kind of product design and customer acquisition. And then you need to move from there into engineering and uh, in industrialized construction, we'll say it's kind of the process of configuration of putting modules or parts together. Then next third, you have manufacturing and production where you have to start um, creating the, the manufacturing. And then finally, you have assembly and logistics at the very end. And one important uh, lesson that we can learn about platforms and industrialized construction is exactly this that normally we're quite used to the idea that information is transferred downstream. In other words, the information we design and customer acquisition must flow to the configuration engineering, must flow to manufacturing and production, and must flow to the assembly and logistics. But what we have that's different in platforms is that also they're an opportunity for us to take rules and restraints of the process. So um, uh, the restraints of how assembly and logistics must occur or what the manufacturing machine can do, um, or, or how you want to configure the, the modules or the buildings. And they can go upstream into the process, all the way up into the design and customer. <laughs> so this is the idea that a platform transfers information downstream, but also embeds the rules and restraints upstream into the system. So I'm going to just pause there and see if anybody has any questions about platforms before I move to the next slide. All right. I don't see any yet, so I'm going to keep going. And if there's questions, we'll have some time at the end of this lecture um, to discuss. OK, so now let's talk about the types of platforms for industrialized construction. And I will be the first to admit that that um, we're trying to give different names to these platforms, uh, but they're very intermixed with one another. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to kind of describe the platforms and how they're different from one another. So the first type is the technical system platform. And that's what you can see. You know, it's the, it's really the product. It's the, it's the kind of product that's being delivered. And the tech, uh, sometimes you'll hear me refer to this as the product platform. The technical platform is the set of subsystems and interfaces of the product family. Um, so it includes, for example, it's like the, you know, if you have a, 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 a building as a product, then you would have a, a, a plat technical platform broken down into the wall sections. Uh, here you could see maybe there's certain stairs that are used over and over again, different roof structures, et cetera. And so th those would be the different subsystems. And those subsystems have interfaces on how they work together uh, with the other parts. Um, and those interfaces should be modularized or systematized into an architecture. Now, when I say a modular architecture, I'm not talking about volumetric cubes. What I'm talking about is the idea that parts are swappable and can be switched in and out in different ways. If you think about a computer, um, a computer was put together with different modular interfaces. So you have a CPU, uh, especially the old PCs, you had the, the CPU component, um, you had a screen, you have, um, you know, you had your memory, and you could start swapping in and out these different parts um, with different brands or different performance specifications um, without changing, you know, the, without changing the overall um, uh, technical design, you could just kind of swap one in and one out. And that happens to the interfaces that connects the subsystems. 
And then there are standards and design rules to which these modules have to conform. So, you know, for example, using again the computer example, uh, you know, a certain, um, you know, a certain program like a Windows XP or something like this, uh, Windows 7, I don't remember what Windows is on now, I'm, I'm, I'm a Mac user, but uh, basically, you know, there's a certain memory standard that's required, right, to run this system, right? So there's certain standards and design rules that each of the modules have to conform to. All right, and then you have the process platform. And the process platform is the specific setup of the production system to produce easily the desired variety of products. So this is the process in which, um, you know, you go through and setting up your production system uh, and, and to make sure that when you're kind of delivering a technical system platform, that you can set up the production system um, step by step. It'll become a little bit more clear in, in a moment. Um, and then furthermore, we're going to talk specifically about digital platforms next week. We have a guest lecture from Project Frog, um, and they're going to talk about how you can use a digital platform, or in other words, a, a configurator, as one step in the process platform. So we have a, a technical platform here, and the technical platform and the process platform must interact with one another. We'll, I'm going to say more about that in a moment. But I just want to point out that also there's a role of digital platforms here, and that might be one step in the process platform where the, the customer can use something like a, a configurator so that they can pick the different modules and parts that they wish to use in the production system. So this will be maybe more clear when you do the reading and we have our next guest lecture, but I just want to point out that the process platform can include the digital platform as part of it. All right, so let's talk about this development process. Um, you, have the, you have a process for technical platform development. Uh, it's, I know it's a bit confusing, but there's a process in which you develop your technical platform and then a process for your process platform. Let's start with the technical platform first. So the technical platform is the platform in which you develop your technical solutions for the building parts. Um, you're basically developing the overall structure. You're, you're, you're developing your, your product. Um, and the, the technical solutions that help you implement that product. Um, and you have to develop a common interfaces and you mean to make sure the components are interchangeable, right? So if you have a, a wall section, you have to define what are the wall interfaces so that I know that I can have wall A or wall B, but both will fit um, the same into my, into my overall system. Um, and then once you've kind of defined the different pieces and subsystems, you have um, solutions for prefabrication and industrialization that get developed within the technical platform. Um, and then, of course, you can start to think about how supporting technology will interact, such as advanced IT tools or configurators or something like that. So, so then you start to think about if I have developed my platform in a certain way, how do I accelerate the process for customization? And second, you have a process for process platform development, okay? So stick with me here, but this is the process in which you are developing um, the different standardizations of processes and methods for your, for your system. So it's the process in which you develop your process. It's the process in which you're going to follow for the setup of the production system. And you're developing your planning methods, you're developing and structuring your production methods and your sub-processes. Um, and then you're figuring out how do you share information between different steps in the process and support it with adequate tools. Um, and then you have to also develop your methods for continuous improvements and customize it with supporting IT tools, such as the configurator that we will talk about next week. So that's the technical platform and the process platform. And then of course, these things are not done in isolation. So there's an interplay between the two. As you develop your technical platform, you also realize that your production system needs to adjust or change in some certain way. So there's a continual interaction and exchange between the technical platform and the process platform. And that's tried, I tried to, to show it here with this, um, this diagram where you have the technical platform moving along in time, and then you have your process platform that moves along in time. And then what's really important is this integration between the two so that they, they talk to one another. Okay, an important point. Customers do not buy platforms. Platforms are for the companies. Um, customers want unique buildings that are built using projects that are based on solutions from the platform. If you remember, I talked about how Volkswagen put $60 billion into their platform. So you need to make investments in your platform to be successful in industrialized construction, but you also need to have a solution to, to 
create unique products, or in our case, unique buildings. And those are built using projects. So let me talk about the, the interaction between the platforms and the projects. <clears throat> so this often happens through the use of the, the project kit. I like to show this slide as just a very quick example. You have your product platform, you know, maybe it's the Legos, and then you have a specific project kit. So you've developed a certain kit that can be used for a, a certain line, right? So you can pick these pieces um, out to, to make the kit for a specific project. And then the projects are built from that kit. And here's, you know, here's all the projects. This is a Lego example of San Francisco, right? So that's the interaction between the product platform, the project kit, and the specific projects. And what that looks like when we map it onto our overall process is that you have your development process of your technical platform, and then you're gonna begin a specific building project here. So that's in blue here is our specific project. And that specific project has a knowledge flow. So what you've developed for your technical and your process platform, go into that specific project, and then come back out and can feed that, it's that feedback loop that goes back into the platform, right? So you've, you do this over and over again, and the lessons you learn from each specific building project and each stage of the building project should go back up into your platform. And this is the whole longitudinal continuity we've talked about, is that the projects need to go and become a learning device that goes back into the technical platform so that the platform gets better for the next, for the next um, projects. And this kind of represents the knowledge flow for the specific building projects. And then if we think about how does this look overall, there is an uh, integration between platforms, processes, and projects together. So here's the, the example. You, you've, you create a, a minimum viable product. We'll talk about minimum viable product later. But that's, this is the idea, is that you have a, a minimum viable product, a version one of your product platform. You've developed it, you've developed some, some subsystems, and you've developed the process platform. And from version one, you're gonna create project, we'll call it X1, okay? So you've developed now project X1, um, and you don't know if it's gonna, you know, what needs to be improved. You're just using your version one to, to, do, to do your project X1. And then you start some other projects. So you start project X2 and project X3, right? And those are all coming from version one of your product platform. But in the meantime, as you can see kind of here, we're saying that project X1 finishes, right? So you finish project X1 and you learned a lot of interesting things. You learn, you know, oh, you know, actually this type of material doesn't work um, or this manufactured, um, you know, type of CNC fabrication is not working with this other part. So we actually need to improve our product platform in, in a certain way. So now we're going to release version two of the platform in red, right? So version two is now an improvement upon your minimum viable product. And it's the idea that you take all your lessons from project X1, your completed project, and you try to embed that into version two of the platform. I've used the example of like iPhone, you know, iPhone 6, iPhone 7, iPhone 8, iPhone 12, um, this is the same idea. And now you've got a version two of your platform and that's gonna go into your next round of projects. So, you know, project Y1 um, will come from version two of the product platform. And in the meantime, you know, you know, project X2, project X3, project Y1, they're all completing and their lessons are being um, returned back into the technical platform and the process platform. And then eventually, now you can release version three whenever you feel like you've developed the, the, the knowledge to create the next version of the, of the platform. And so this is the interaction effect between platforms, processes, and projects together. Again, the goal is that uh, you're learning in a structured way, and that learning is being embedded back into the technical platforms so that you can release it version by version. So again, uh, version one might be your minimum viable product, and version two and version three is a later version of the product platform that represents an improved product. Okay, I'm gonna see if there are any short questions now about the product platforms, and then I'm gonna do a very short case study um, about, about product platforms um, implemented uh, for a real company. But I just wanna see if there's any questions right now before I move on.
Okay. Um, if you have any, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll answer them at the very end. But I want to continue on um, with a case study really quickly. This is a company um, called Vedica um, with their, their product platform called Vedica Max. Um, a little bit about Vedica um, is that, let's see, they are a Norwegian company, but I visited them in, in Sweden in 2016. Here's a picture of me um, visiting their, their process center. And their Swedish group was doing some really interesting things around, uh, around a product platform. Um, let's see if I can get this going. Yeah, so, so they created something called the Vedica Max Industrialized Building System. And the idea behind it was that um, there are some things that can be standardized and repeated, and then there are other things that should be configurable. And they worked really hard to identify the areas that were configurable and the ones that they wanted to repeat. And so you could look at here, um, this was how they described the interaction between the process platform, which they really focused on lean construction and virtual design and construction, um, and the technical platform, which was this Vedica Max product platform. And I'll, I'll talk a lot about how they developed their technical platform solutions. But they were trying to solve the problem of kind of mid-rise family housing. You can see some of the units here, um, you know, maybe three to, to eight stories tall um, with, uh, you know, kind of concrete construction of a, of a technical, um, technical solution. And so they looked at the, the opportunity to modularize, which would be to standardize components and the interfaces, and then configure the unique buildings. They were, they were not configuring these using kind of a cloud-based configurator. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but more within their own in-house team, they created, they created specific rules in which they could configure the building. <clears throat> All right, so the rule of thumb that they used, they wanted to standardize building parts that don't add value to the end user or the client. Um, this would be the, impart, the apartment height, um, the layout for the stairs and the elevators, the structural building parts. They didn't feel like the client or the end user cared about those things in particular. So they standardized those building parts and then they wanted to be able to customize the other parts of the, of the project. And one key innovation that they came up with was this idea of the, of the heart of the building system. I won't try to say the, 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 <laughs> the Swedish translation because my Swedish is worse than my German, but um, I will, uh, this was the, the, the heart. So they have this core system here that has certain things like the kitchen fixtures and things like this. Um, and then it goes, uh, it goes into like a box and that box can be stacked on top of each other and fit into a core cutout so that um, the services could go down below. And in the meantime, they have something here called the octopus, which was their electrical connection point that could go on top of this box and spread out to all the different, um, uh, for example, the different, uh, 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 electrical wiring could go and, and connect um, so that you could then just put the box on top and unroll the octopus and make connections for power into all the rooms. I'll show you how that, that works in a moment. So they produced these installation modules in their own factory and did about 90% of all the installation work offsite. So here's how they were working on the installation um, of, the, of the system. And here's how you can see that it was stacked on top of each other, right? So you have each of these hearts um, or core systems, and you can see the pipes running up and down. So the pipes can make a vertical connection. You see then here you start the horizontal connections of the, of the HVAC pipes. Um, and traditionally you have many trades working in tight spaces with really tasks that are highly important for the completion of the project and the critical path. But now with the new Vedica Max system, everything was done offsite. And this meant very few or almost no handovers. It sped up the entire process and could shorten their critical path activities. This is here, the, the octopus product. It looks exactly like this. And so it's just a, a kind of um, a connection box that sits on top and then they spread it out. So here you see going through the floors before the concrete is poured, um, they just spread out the entire system so they can make all the flexible connections, but without being confined uh, so rigidly because they wanted to be able to work out some of the solutions on the construction site. Um, yeah, here you can see now here's the core system and here's the octopus going and providing these electrical services to all the different pieces and parts of the, of the system. And they wanted to make sure everything could be done with quick connections, right? So they didn't have to have uh, long-term tie-ins of electrical wiring, but instead using quick connections, 
they could make the speed much, much faster so that you could do all the electrical work within a day or a similar amount of time. <clears throat> and then here was their, their process platform. So they first spent around, the idea was they want to spend around eight to 16 hours with just the outline of the building. Um, and this was several years ago, so I'm sure that the, the process has improved even faster now. But the architects had rules from the building system when drawing the, the, the building unit. And then they had four to eight hours where they would import the model from the architect into uh, a service called Vico, which would allow them to, um, to create a production plan, create a bill of materials, understand the cost and the schedule and LOB, which stands for line of balance. And from using the standardized um, product platform, they were able to get a tender to client in a 50% less time using much less people. Um, and it gave them a much more accurate tendering process too, because they knew exactly the costs of these individual um, building units that make up their, their, um, their heart and also their, their external um, concrete slabs. And they also worked on their improving their process platform by improving their onsite instructions. So oftentimes, you know, the instru construction plans are given as, you know, printed documents with very you know, detailed specific measurements for um, dimensions and things like this. But it doesn't always convey important points about assembly processes, which can be just as key and important for workers, including their safety. And so taking inspiration from IKEA, you can kind of see here, they, they made visual instructions that came with their, their platform um, so that the workers could kind of understand here are some important things to think about when you're assembling the building. So here's like some, some warning signs Again, I, I can't read the Swedish, so I don't really know exactly what they mean, but they're, they're kind of uh, warnings about how when you install the stairs, how to think about different ways of installation should occur. Um, furthermore, then you have some additional points here about you know, where should a wall go and making it as visual and clear as possible so that any worker can understand the rules of the, of the platform. Um, and then finally, on the process platform side, they created uh, tool trolleys for specific activities. So because they understood the process and the production process, they then created special kits um, or special uh, equipment kits on wheels that you know, they knew that they needed these kits for all of the different octopuses, for example. And then they could just have this kit follow the crew that works on installing the octopus. And it should have everything that they need and nothing that they don't. So they don't have to bring lots of extra equipment and uh, take extra time to bring the equipment on the project site. So this was a very specific way of improving their process platform. Okay, I'm gonna summarize it here. And if you have questions, feel free now. It's a good time to put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. Um, but in summary, you have this inter interaction between platforms, processes, and projects. And all together, this creates the idea of the building as a product. Um, you need to separate the development processes from the building projects. So development of your platform is separate from your individual projects. You have to establish information flow in both directions. So of course, your platform informs your projects, but it's just as important that your projects go back and inform your platforms um, so you can release your next version. And this must fit within the company's organization. It creates the opportunity for new roles. Um, you see this in your own projects, how I've defined some new roles, but you have someone that needs to be the lead product designer, of course. Um, and then you also need to have a product platform manager. So someone that manages the platform as it evolves from, from moment to moment. And also someone that improves the, the process. So the process improvement manager, someone specifically looking at the development of the process platform and thinking about from each project to project, how it can get better. Um, and then you have new tasks that emerge in these platforms. So you have a configuration, um, which we'll talk about next week. You have product and system development and um, the interfaces between the products and systems, and also the new task of continuous improvement, which we don't often have in traditional construction. So altogether, um, this creates the, the overall um, product platform. Now, a summary of the differences between a project design and the platform development. The project design, again, I'll say this, I've said this many times, but it's unique team solutions and buildings. It starts from low levels of common knowledge. Input from production is rare. There's limited levels of details because the costs must be covered by that one project. You can't invest 60 billion in the platform. It all must be covered by one project. And that project is always a prototype, which leads to scarce conditions for continuous improvement. By contrast, platform development really focuses on continuity as the foundation, 
The solutions are based on repetitive use and improvements. The platform development team is composed of people from multiple backgrounds and competencies. So you would want to have people representing architecture, engineering, manufacturing, um, even sales in that platform development. Um, and then you have a high level of details because the cost can be spread out over many projects and the solutions can be tested before implementation. And so that would be the, the summary. And the key word here would be continuity. So continuity of technology and systems, continuity of process and methods, and continuity of team and relations. All right, so I hope that is a very nice uh, introduction to the building as a product and thinking about platforms, projects, and processes. Um, we're going to take a break now, uh, but I also want to see if there are any questions, feel free to put them up um, uh, during the break. Uh, furthermore, I have one specific um, announcement about the project team. So the project teams have been formulated. Um, they should be posted on Moodle now, or if not, they'll be posted very soon. I'm, uh, I'm going to create um, also some breakout rooms in about five minutes. Um, actually, I'm not going to make breakout rooms now, but at the end of class today, I'm going to create um, some breakout rooms. So if you want to say hello to your team, um, then I'll just have the breakout rooms so you don't have to leave Zoom. And you can have a chance to just say hello to your team, maybe make some plans about um, how you want to get started on the project. And uh, Firhi Watt will be introducing our challenges each week. So each week you have a specific kind of task to be oriented to, and uh, Firhi Watt has already made um, the first uh, video, it's about three minutes long, we'll post it onto Moodle and you can watch the video and it will help kind of guide your discussions. Um, ideally, this was going to be what was going to happen in the Wednesday lab class before we canceled it. Uh, but now we think a, a kind of a three minute video um, to help guide your discussions will help. And we've also set up a, a Jamboard template so you can start putting in some ideas um, into the Jamboard as a as some examples uh, or, or as a way of kind of structuring your thoughts and following along with the different um, tasks per week to work on. So uh, that's kind of some details about the project. Um, if you haven't seen, please go online, take a look at the team set up. Um, and at the end of class today, as I mentioned, uh, I'll set up some breakout rooms so you can, so you can um, get started meeting your team and getting started on the first week's task. All right, with that, uh, let's take a break. And um, after the break, we will start with our guest lecture.